Welcome to Basic Brewing Radio for Thursday, February 18th, 2016. I'm James Spencer. Here at Basic Brewing Radio, we're all about home brewing. This week, Mary Pelletieri, author of Quality Management, Essential Planning for Breweries, joins us to give us tips on getting a handle on our quality management processes. How can the quality management practices of big and small breweries apply to us at home? If you're new to home brewing or would like to get into the hobby for the first time, check out our website, basicbrewing.com, where you can find archives of our audio and video podcasts and our DVDs to walk you through basic and more advanced brewing techniques. And if you buy any of our DVD combos, you get a free basic brewing bottle opener. And don't forget, get a copy of our Brewer's Logbook while you're at it. You can use it to log and track up to 50 batches of beer. Talk, talk about your quality management strategy. It starts right there, I think. You can follow me on Twitter. My username is Basic Brewing, all one word. We also have a Basic Brewing Radio and Basic Brewing Video page on Facebook at facebook.com slash basicbrewing. Thanks again to everybody clicking on our Amazon.com associate link on our basicbrewing.com site. Whenever you think of Amazon shopping, think of us first and click on our associate link. It won't cost you any extra, and you'll be helping us to bring you the show. We greatly appreciate your support. We also have associate links for Brew Your Own Magazine and the American Home Brewers Association on our site as well. You can find our Basic Brewing iPhone app on iTunes, our Android app on Amazon.com. We have a, a Windows phone app. We're on the BlackBerry podcast directory and we're on the Stitcher app as well. If you want to pit a t- uh, put a tip in our tip jar or pit a tip in our ch- – <laughs> whatever you want to do. If you want to put a tip in our tip jar – some coinage in our guitar case. You can go to basicbrewing.com slash support, and thanks to everybody who's done so already. And if you contribute via the uh, support link, I'll send you an email with links to this year's bonus video showing Steve making Kansas City burnt ends out of chuck roast and cooking it up on his personal barbecue uh, or with his uh, personal barbecue sauce recipe to go along with it, uh, along with the the previous two years' uh, bonus videos as well. As you might be able to tell uh, by my uh, cold medicine-induced fog and my uh, raspy voice, I'm getting over a cold, uh, so I want to keep my comments short. But in uh, in looking at the mailbag, we're still getting advice for Matt in San Antonio on his big holiday beer that didn't carbonate in the bottle. Sean from Austin, which is not too far away from San Antonio, says... Uh, I haven't used champagne yeast, but I know that Danstar has a yeast strain called CBC1 that is made for bottle conditioning and bred to ferment simple sugars, i.e. priming sugar, without fermenting residual malt sugars like dextrins, maltotriose, etc. Uh, I've used it with great success in barley wines, wheat wines, and quads with up to 12.5% ABV. It carbs up nicely in two to three weeks and leaves a dense sediment that is easy to keep in the bottle at serving time. And it it seems to do a great job of using up residual oxygen because barley wine I bottled with it two years ago is still getting better with age. I've always added it in the bottling bucket, and a little goes a long way. About a third of a pack is enough to carb up a five-gallon batch. Since Matt has already bottled maybe the old advice of sanitized tweezers and two to three grains of yeast in each bottle would do the trick, I wish I had a better idea of how to add it now that the beer is bottled, but I can definitely say that CBC1 is the right yeast for the job, and he should try it for his next big beer. Thanks, Sean. I, th- I believe that uh, that we did uh, mention that yeast in a previous answer, but I, I like the additional details, uh, the additional info that Sean gives on that. This upcoming Monday, I'm going to post another cocktail episode of Basic Brewing Video. This is the second show that we recorded on the day that we made vermouth out of Steve's homemade wine. Uh, In next week's show, Steve takes my molasses mead. Uh, You might remember that it came out a bit sweet for my taste. And Steve uses it to make a Manhattan, or as I called it, a meadhattan. We had a lot of fun with that one. Maybe too much fun (laughs) looking at the video. Uh, be, be sure to check that feed, and um, and wherever you find our, our video podcasts, check that on Monday. I was looking at the website of our sponsors, Desiree and Dave of High Gravity in Tulsa, highgravitybrew.com, and I saw a new ingredient kit uh, that I hadn't seen before that I find very appealing right now, Sinister Coffee Stout. This beer ingredient kit is inspired by Left Hand Milk Stout, 
it's like an espresso with cream, the website says. Uh, this very dark, sweet, full-bodied, slightly roasty ale is perfect for cold winter nights or frosty winter mornings. Uh, the addition of double shots, cold-pressed, concentrated coffee, and economically friendly uh, collapsible bags adds a perfectly balanced coffee and cream flavor. Now, uh, this, recipe, this, this kit appeals to me for two reasons. First of all, I am a sinister person. I'm left-handed. Look up sinister in the dictionary if you don't get the joke. And uh, a coffee stout sounds like the perfect beer to come out of a cold with, you know, to kind of uh, uh, perk me up with the uh, caffeine and and the, the creaminess soothe my throat a little bit. Uh, now, if you go to the the page for Sinister, the uh, Sinister Coffee Stout Kit on HighGravityBrew.com, you can find that you can customize the kit to your liking. Not only can you choose extract or all grain, and choose whether you'd like your grain crushed or not. You can now choose whether to add ingredients. What? You can take your beer to the nth degree with high gravity ingredients and create a unique flavor experience. Right there on the Sinister uh, Coffee Stout page uh, near the bottom, you can choose to add things like cacao nibs, hazelnut flour, uh, Oklahoma honey, oak chips, and other fun stuff, including fruit purees. Now, I don't know how <laughs> I don't know how a peach puree would go with a coffee stout, but that's not my business. If you want to try it, uh, it's it's all out there for your option. Check it out for yourself at highgravitybrew.com. Take your beer to the nth degree with high gravity nth ingredients. And as usual, you can get flat rate shipping of seven dollars and ninety nine cents for ingredients and many other products at highgravitybrew.com. Okay, let's get away from my scratchy voice and talk to Mary Pelletieri about her book, Quality Management, Essential Planning for Breweries. Mary Pelletieri, welcome to Basic Brewing Radio. Hi, good morning, James. Thanks for having me. You've written the book called Quality Management, Essential Planning for Breweries. And uh, we're, we're, we, we like to say we're all about home brewing here on Basic Brewing Radio, but uh, we do have professional brewers who listen to the show and uh you know quality management home brewers can benefit from from quality management to practices as well because quality is everything isn't it well yeah i mean i think most brewers are 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 naturally dedicated to quality because they're trying out new things and new flavors and um that's really why they get into it because they want to make a quality beer um when i started in my brewing career, I actually was a home brewer, so um, I remember the desire to have better yeast and the desire to, you know, go all grain and have more control. And I think it's just ingrained in the practice of the hobby to want to have better quality. Talk about your background. How did you come to know enough to write a book on quality management? Yeah. Um, well, like I said, I started home brewing, and I went um, from there to the Siebel Institute, which was at the time testing beer from all over the world and had a lab, and I worked in their lab part-time and uh, was going to graduate school. And I was going to graduate school for environmental and health science, and I thought that's where my um, career would lead me, but um, Siebel basically offered me a job when I was finished, and I took it. So I just stayed in the lab there and eventually um, worked my way into the sensory lab and ran that for a while and then worked my way into teaching um, at Siebel for both the lab course and the sensory course. And that was um, a good start because I would have brewers come in there, you know, from all over the world um, and they were all growing at the time. This was back in the mid-90s, so um, some of those breweries obviously shut down, but many stayed in business, and many of those brewers are now, you know, the head of the breweries that they were with, um, and they were just getting training back then. But Goose Island was one of the breweries that always came to visit, and um, I left Siebel for a few years and went and learned a little bit more about the quality trade at a food testing facility, um, and I... I basically taught sanitation and FDA stuff for a while, and then I came back to the brewing world when Goose Island called me. And I stayed there for eight and a half years, 
um, building their quality program, um, changing up the testing program all the time, and then eventually went to Miller Coors and uh, worked at a very large facility, the Miller Coors Milwaukee Brewery, for five years as a quality manager uh, there as well. And quality nowadays, uh, especially uh, when there are so many beers out there, um, and you know people are trying different beers, trying different breweries, and they may only try your beer once, uh, and if it's not any good, they they may not ever come back. So quality nowadays, especially with the crowded marketplace, is even more important, isn't it? Yeah, and I think the craft um, craft beer, especially the Brewers Association, recognized this that craft beer as a as a brand. Um, really needs to uh, focus on, on safety and quality to make sure that those breweries are are putting out the best beer possible because people go to craft beer um, because they associate that with quality. So if um, the beer isn't as good as you want it and you should be trained to know what good tastes like, um, then you shouldn't be um, in business really. <laughs> <laughs> Although every brewer I know has had to dump a batch, so um, it's part of the it's part of being in business is those those quality issues come up. You got to know how to deal with them. Yeah, Ken Grossman wrote the from Sierra Nevada wrote the uh, the forward or the uh, the preface for your book, and he one of the things he said was don't be afraid to dump a batch of beer. Right. And uh, that goes for home brewers as well. I mean, if you uh, make a bad batch of beer and then you give it to your friends or try to enter it into a competition, you're not going to get good results. Yeah, I mean, why bother, right? Um, and, and, you know, some people are afraid of losing the money, but if it's not drinkable, it, you're, you're, you might lose more than just, just the money that you lost from, from that batch. So, um, yeah, I think it's, it's just part of brewing. You can control as much as you can control, but sometimes there's variables and factors that are outside of your realm of control, and um, they may go uh, haywire, you know, mm -hmm. uh, and I think even big brewers recognize this. Um, if and of course the stakes are much higher for a big brewer that doesn't um, that doesn't do the right thing at the right time. And I've been again in uh, medium to big breweries, and we've all had to dump batches. It happens everywhere. So how do we define quality uh, when we're talking about beer? What are the components that that you're looking at? Well, I think um, quality in beer is is um, kind of starting at the core is very much a sensory thing. So, is is it balanced? Does it taste right for the style? Um, is there um, is the is the beer drinkable? So that drinkability factor is kind of the first thing, um, and then the second is it you know is it technically well made? Um, did the fermentation um, go as planned? Are there any off flavors that uh, maybe um, technically shouldn't be there. Um, so I think usually that's the core. The what what builds out of that is how you continually do that, how you continually make that um, ideal batch, and and how you do that is usually a, a big, a fairly large system of of record keeping and data monitoring and um, always learning, continuously learning is usually how I describe a quality program. Um, it starts with knowing what you want to achieve and then how you do that and how you record and monitor information uh, along the way. Now, a lot of it's just paying attention, right? Yeah, sure. Um, yeah, making records of how a batch tastes, you know, as simple as that, um, can be considered a quality record. And if you changed a variable that, you know, say you changed the mash temperature or you noticed a pH was a little different, um, how did that impact flavor? So it's always it's always good to have some sort of output record and then everything that you that went into the batch, all those inputs, um, anything you can record, record it. So time, temperatures, pHs, if you have a pH meter throughout the whole process, those are good, you know, basic measurements. And, of course, Play-Doh, I think most home brewers are recording their Play-Dohs or their, their gravities um, because they want to know how much alcohol they're making. Mm -hmm. So I think um, you know those are very basic input measurements, and then you have to have some sort of record of how it tasted, how the output was. And you might want to think about uh, when you buy uh, batches of ingredients, say bags of uh, specialty malts or something like that, you might want to 
tag those uh, to let you let yourself remind yourself when you bought them. Uh, I, for instance, uh, w- had some friends over the other day teaching them how to brew, and I brought out this bag of uh, black patent malt, and I said, "Here, taste this." And I, you know, tried to describe the taste that they were uh, going to taste, and we tasted it, and and the uh, <laughs> the bag was stale. Mm. And, <laughs> and you know, and the guy said, "Well, why did you make me taste this?" And I said, "Well, I." <laughs> I didn't. That was a good experience, actually. <laughs> yeah, exactly. I was just testing your palate. No, but <laughs> but you know, typically, uh, I don't I don't taste my ingredients before uh, you know I put them in the batch. And if I had made a batch of beer with that uh, with that specialty malt, it would have been bad. So yeah. keep keeping track of your ingredients before they go in the in the mash tun or the brew pot uh, is key as well. Yeah, you know, even big brewers taste um, every malt load they receive. They usually take a, a large spear, they go up on top of the, the truck, and they'll spear the inside of the truck, or uh, and basically takes a large sample of malt, and they're able to look at it. So they look at the malt, they taste the malt, um, and make sure that it is what they ordered effectively, um, and that there was no off flavors in the transport or within the, the shipment of it. Because even, um, you know, even ba- bag malt, um, can taste moldy or have some moisture Im- impact it. So I think it's just a standard thing to taste taste your ingredients, smell your hops. Um, and if you have pitchable yeast in a liquid form, you can taste it, hmm. um, you know, just to make sure it tastes fresh, tastes like kind of fresh bread yeast, um, an older yeast strain, or if it tastes sour, you know, there's something not right with that yeast. I, sensory is, is easily the best quality tool you have, um, and it can be um, it can and can save you. You know, it can prevent you from using that bad malt or that bad yeast if if you if you're doing it consistently. And you talk, you spend a lot of time in the book uh, talking about setting up a quality management program, and obviously for bigger brewers uh, that looks different from a small craft brewer or a home brewer. But are there things in common? from small breweries or home breweries to large breweries as far as sell- setting up a kind of quality management program? Sure. I mean, every brewery's got to keep a record. Every home brewer is going to keep a batch record. Um, that's the the most basic. And, you know, if you think about the big, big, big breweries, their batch records are going to be electronic. Um, but they're still keeping batch records. I, I tell the story that um, one big brewery I know, and I won't mention the name, actually, their entire quality system was based off of a paper system. Hmm. Um, and they built this DOS program based off a paper system, which literally the batch followed um, throughout the system. It was a good way to keep record of, of what batch went where. Um, but it's kind of an interesting because they would use these terminology and it came from this old paper system. Um, so, you know, Keeping paper systems is not um, for naught. It's something that how every brewery starts. Um, even the the bigger regionals today started with paper system, and some even keep maintaining that um, because you have to um, record every little bit of detail you can. Usually, breweries are as I as I like to say metric rich, and you have too much too much data. Um, to even think about how you're going to dive into it if something went wrong, but um, most breweries are are keen on keeping records for um, at the very very start and a lot of a lot of data. <laughs> so, so that's the similarity between everyone. So what should we what should we be keeping track of? What are the key components that we should be looking at? Well, I think um, at the, within that batch record, obviously, um, if you have recorded your malt and your hops and your yeast lots and and when you receive them like you said that's a good kind of starting point if you did any sensory on them how they tasted and then you go into your process records and everything from times and temperatures and pHs throughout the whole process pH of your water pH of your mash pH of your um of your work before knockout um that sort of thing or those are good records to keep um any visual records of how the hot break happened, when it happened, um, those are also good. In, it's just good information in case um, something doesn't go right. Uh, and then yields, usually brewers are very keen on getting their, their uh, right amount of, of work through the system, the right amount of beer out of the system. It's not so critical for a home brewer, but, um, you know, if you 
if you have a good hot break, you're probably not going to get a, as much yield out of out of that um, out of your kettle, which is actually maybe that's a good thing. You know, maybe that actually improved the flavor because you got a really good boil. So those things are all really good information to keep during fermentation. You keep records of of how it's fermented, how it smelled. Did did you get a gravity at the start of fermentation when it was really starting to rock and roll? Um, did you get a? If you have a microscope, you could count your yeast. You know, there's like I said, there's just data and data and data throughout the whole process, but. Um, the most simple things are, are gravities and pH, and then any sensory data you can gather, including visuals, throughout the throughout the process. That reminds me, I spent 12 years in corporate communications for uh, a major meat uh, company, and uh, you know part of the part of that was training materials for uh, you know quality and safety, mm-hmm. uh, and the terms total quality management and uh, HACCP or hazard analysis critical control point, you know those pop up in the uh, in the book. Um, and can you talk about those? What what those terms mean and what they might mean for a small brewer or a home brewer? Well. The Brewers Association asked me to write a book about quality, and in my career, since I had kind of a varied career, I went from brewing back into the food industry and then back into brewing. I had a different lens on when I went back into brewing, which was, you know, food companies have a very different approach to quality, um, not completely, you know, out of whack of what breweries were doing, but much more food safety and and um, uh, just much more of a food safety approach. Um, the total quality management movement, um, which it kind of impacted not only manufacturing, but it went into kind of business processes. Um, I wanted to introduce brewers to these terms and these concepts. HACCP is another one that um, is was very heavy, obviously used in meat and, 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 um, meat and eggs and, and dairy. Um, and even juice, but we're, as brewers, weren't necessarily required to do a HACCP program. Um, And I wanted to really introduce these terms, HACCP being a um, food safety program that large companies put in place very early on, at least in food, to um, help control hazards that they might have been missing in their quality system. So I, I think it was just important to tee up the world of quality to brewers because there's many people that are new to brewing. They might get into brewing because they were home brewers and they um, they don't necessarily come out of a manufacturing field or an engineering field. Um, and those fields are, are ripe with um, just this, this body of knowledge of quality. Um, and it was time to kind of put all that together for professional brewers because um, some of them knew it and some of them didn't. Hmm. So it was um, it was just a, a good starting point to get a reference document, reference out there that that um, really summarized the world of quality for them. When you uh, when you talk about critical control points, uh, these are are essentially points in the process where things can go wacky, uh, right? And and points where you can uh, monitor the product as it's going through the process to sort of uh, make sure that it's on the right track and make sure that it's uh, that it's not going bad at that particular point, right? Yeah, um, you know, in a quality system, there's things that you monitor that are process related, so your times and temperatures and yields, and then there's things that you monitor that you might actually pull the beer out of the system and measure it. Some, you know, some Plato gravity or pH. Um, those are points in in time in which you can correct something. So critical control point is a little different. Um, you might call all of those other things I just mentioned control points. Um, a critical control point is considered a food safety control point where um, and it may not even be measuring the beer itself. It might be measuring something surrounding the beer. Um, for example, in packaging, where when we were um, packaging beer, um, we would actually have to measure the the flow of the um, water that was going through the the bottle rinser because if it got too low the potential of a hazard such as a physical hazard or some broken glass or something in a bottle could get rinsed out Hmm. so that was considered a critical control point um, in which we had to have special record keeping Um, 
breweries in general um, have to have to really watch their physical hazards um, and then any chemical hazards so that you're rinsing your chemi chemicals properly off your tanks or any any surface that touches the beer um, you know those are considered critical because if you don't do those right you could potentially harm I guess quality control point might be a good way to look at uh, at most of these things that we need to be looking at yeah they, um, they call them QCPs or or CPs, control points, or quality control points. I get email, uh, not as much as I used to, but I get e email from new brewers saying, my beer keeps turning out bad. What, what am I doing wrong? Uh, <laughs> <laughs> and, man, there are so many places where where people could be doing things in, right. in the wrong way. And so you can't, you know, and, and what I usually do is fire back, well, you know, here are some things that you might want to be looking at, you know. Uh, but uh, we do an annual disaster show, uh, you know, at the end of every year here on Basic Brewing Radio. And, and this past year, we had a story uh, of these guys, this group of guys who were getting together to make beers together. And, and they had like three batches turn out sour. Mm. And so they finally decided, OK, we're going to look at the process and check everything in every you know, at every stage. And so they, you know, during firm, they tasted the wort, uh, they tasted the, uh, you know, the beer coming out of the, uh, the uh, primary fermenter into the secondary fermenter, you know, into the bottling bucket, tasted great. Mm -hmm. They bottled the beer, uh, turned out sour. <laughs> well, that's, um, yeah, that's a great, at least they traced back to where the root cause was. Um, but but in, it, it, it turned out that, that they had a, they bought a two pound bag, not of priming sugar, but of citric acid. So. <laughs> <laughs> wow. So they had wonderful beer all the way, you know, all the way into the bottling bucket where they put, they primed it with citric acid. So they were getting this sour, flat beer every time and they, and they didn't know why. So there you oh, go. There's goodness. a quality point, uh, you know, checking every single little thing along the line. Uh, you know, you could, it could be a rewarding process. Well, certainly, and that, yeah, and that, you know, that's one of those corrections that you can make pretty easily. Make sure you look at whatever you're putting into your beer, you record the lot number and what it is. Um, because, yeah, you yeah, you could do a silly thing. There's, I, when people are trying to troubleshoot, um, you know, you first you have to identify what's bad. What is bad about this? Is it under-fermented? Is it, is it sour? Is it, you know, potentially microbial? problems is it just a problem with um dms or diacetyl you know these off flavors that um, can have many roots and i think if you're able to do that um and breweries um many times and this is where i caution brewers no matter the size say you have diacetyl well oh we crashed the tank too fast well, that may or may not be the reason why you had diacetyl. So um, that's a potential root, but there's, you know, many roots. So no matter what the problem, um, if you think you know the answer, make sure you write down all the potential root causes and, like your friends did, trace back to what um, it actually is because you just you don't know until you know. Many breweries can solve problems and then have to solve them again and again and again because they don't actually address the root cause. Um, that's the fun part about quality is doing the problem solving. But doing it right takes some time and, and patience and, and um, diligence like your friends had to do. And you mentioned sensory analysis. Uh, getting other viewpoints or other people to taste your beer, whether you're a home brewer or a professional brewer, uh, is essential as well in getting input uh, to determine whether the beer is good or not, and if it's not good, what's not good about it. Right. Yeah. Um, I think having a few points of view on that, if you don't know, you know, you're saying this batch doesn't taste right, try to get a few um, additional measures, and if you can't actually you know, measure pHs, like I said, or um, anything else, micro or you can always use other people as a sensory tool and, and see what they say. Um, sometimes it's just not very easy to troubleshoot with sensory alone. You, you might need extra, extra measurement. Um, and I think there's now some more uh, reasonably priced uh, quality measures that you can get for, for home brewers. Like maybe your BUs are just wrong or maybe um, 
maybe you use too much malt of one kind or the other. You know, there's there's records that you can look back on, but um, I think I think measure is what you can, and if it's just sensory, uh, make sure you get a good variety of people that have good palates to help you figure out what might have gone wrong, and then do due diligence to get to the root cause of it. So talk about uh, beyond sensory analysis. Talk about the tests that are available for brewers, uh, and kind of go from the the low end to the high end. I mean, what is what's accessible as far as testing is concerned for for home brewers and small craft brewers, and what do the big guys use? Well, everyone uses um, a measure of gravity, sugar, um, one way or another. I think. Um, the caution for home brewers is to learn how to use hydrometers properly, or if you're using a refractometer, uh, understand how to use that properly as well. Um, I always like to take multiple measurements at, at phases where um, if, if the precision or the accuracy of the equipment isn't all that great or the person measuring it isn't all that great, take a few measurements. It doesn't hurt. and Take an average. Um, so I think there's some real basic blocking and tackling that everyone has to do, and that's measuring um, sugar throughout the process as well as um, pH. Um, pH is another tool that's used that many times can um, go wonky on you, and a, a few tenths of a pH difference is a big deal. So you have to make sure that your pH meter, if you're using a meter, is calibrated and um, functioning properly, and don't assume, you know, test mm -hmm. it before you use it. Um, those are just some basics that everyone uses. I think um, beyond that, if you have a microscope, um, you try to look at your yeast and count your yeast and um, use that microscope as much as you can to look at the beer. You might look at beer sediments in your bottle um, just to see what, what's there. Um, microscope's a very simple tool and not that expensive. You know, I encourage home brewers to, if they can, find a used microscope or um, even just go online and get um, some, some you know, student microscope. They really aren't that expensive and you can kind of share it with other people. And it's a fun tool to use. So um, it kind of makes you look at the smallest little elements of your, of your brewing and your beer. <laughs> it's kind of exciting. Um, I think... So beyond sensory, those tools are used universally. Um, once you get into a brewery, you you start to use more equipment such as a spectrophotometer to help you measure color and bitterness and some other um, basic um, components to beer. You can do all sorts of things with a spectrophotometer in terms of wet chemistry. Um, and then some brewers go on and get you know fancy tools to measure alcohol, fancy tools to measure dissolved oxygen expensive things. Um, they might have a real fancy tool called a gas chromatograph that measures many things sensory, they, it, but it, it gives it an accurate representation of, of your vicinal vis diketones, your, your VDKs, so your diacetyl and acetoin and anything that's precursor to VDK. Um, so it's actually, you know, it can get very technical, as you can well imagine. Mm -hmm. <laughs> um, and the cost continues to go up. So, um, but everyone, you know, it's funny because going from the smallest to the largest of breweries, everyone suffers from a lot of the same stuff. Um, protein and protein issues and colloidal issues. So the beer gets hazy in the bottle or the beer um, gets hazy when it's chilled. Those are common problems I see everywhere. Um, micro and spoilage are common problems I see everywhere. And yeast handling, just not pitching enough yeast or pitching over pitching, um, common problems you see everywhere. And mm -hmm. it, it's uh, once you have those basic tools, even the most basic tools can give you a lot of information in brewing. So start with Plato and pH and your sensory, and you're you're on your way. And you you got to make sure that your tools are calibrated as well. That's correct. Yes, good point. You know, I did kind of mention that. Regarding using the hydrometer properly and using a pH meter properly, making sure it's working, functioning, reading correct. That includes sensory, though. You know, a lot of people don't think of calibrating their palate, but you should calibrate. Um, a great way to do that is learn to become a judge, um, which helps you learn from other judges or taste as many different styles of beers with um, people that are a little more tuned to it or have been professionally trained. 
Um, they can help you start to pick out these different nuances of beer flavor. And the other thing you can do is just um, you know, get those kits or sensory kits that are out there. You can share cost on that with other people and train yourself on off flavors. Um, dial in your, your uh, sense to, to the off flavors. Uh, once, once you do that, you really are um, really have a lot of tools at your, uh, to use. Um, very basic, but they work. Is there, a, is there a piece of advice or, or a small set of uh, pieces of advice that you most often uh, give to brewers? Or, or is, there a, is there a problem that is the most common that you, uh, that you come across as far as quality management standpoint? Um, yeah, I think cleaning and sanitation is um, not very well understood in a lot of breweries. And I don't know why that is. Um, I think my, my sense is, you know, I came out of food and I learned how to clean and sanitize from the people that sold the chemicals. Um, a lot of brewer, brewers come out of brewing schools and they kind of learn one way, and it might be an old way, you know, because brewing schools, they, they kind of, they come out of very old tradition, German traditions of brewing, that sort of thing. Um, so I'm always kind of surprised at how little is known about cleaning and sanitizing and really the new technologies in cleaning and sanitizing and how easy it is to screw up. Um, the most basic thing that a brewer can do is measure the amount of caustic that they're using, measure the amount of, of, um, of sanitizer they're using, actually in the fluid that's sanitizing, um, to make sure that it's the right quantity. And, you know, sanitizers are meant to be non-rinse, so if you have the right quantity, you don't need to rinse it. And a lot of breweries still rinse their sanitizer off. And I always wonder, why did you just do that? <laughs> <laughs> exactly. It's kind of like, you know, it, it, it's not akin. It's kind of like adding a lime to a beer, you know. <laughs> <laughs> if you really brewed the beer all you wanted to taste, why do you have to lime, add a lime to it? Like, <laughs> Not quite. Careful, but you can careful Mary. There's, there's, there's no reason to rinse sanitizer off if you did the sanitation properly. But, um, you know, people are afraid of flavors from sanitizers, and they think rinsing it might be better, but they're potentially introducing more micros. So um, there's just a lot of mis misunderstanding in, in sanitation, and those are usually the most um, prevalent of problems that you find in breweries. Um, something doesn't get sanitized properly. We we did shows uh, with manufacturers of uh, Iota Four and Starsan uh, years ago, and those are some of the most popular shows uh, in the archives. People in mm -hmm. you know I still get comments from people saying, God, you know, I just I didn't know uh, because people think the well if if a little bit of uh, Starsan in in uh, this uh, sanit you know in my carboy to sanitize it, you know, a little more will be uh, great and right. you know a little more better. I yeah. use about three glugs, you know, out of the bottle. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, you know, dipsticks are really something that's a very easy investment. You can um, get dipsticks for sanitizers online now. You know, Amazon obviously has all this stuff, but even at restaurant um, supply shops, um, restaurants have to make sure that the sanitizing water that they're using is not too high. It's not too high in sanitizers. So um, if you're using a chlorine sanitizer, there's dipsticks out there to help you measure it properly. I'm sure there are for iodine. I know. Um, um, we do a titration using parasitic acid. So there's all sorts of things you can use, but it is one of those critical things that um, it, it could be considered as a CCP. You know, if you have too much sanitizer, you could be actually harming yourself by drinking that beer. Mm. Um, because some sanitizers, obviously, you don't want to drink. Right, right. <laughs> Uh, if, if it has a warning sticker on the container, uh, <laughs> yep. you might not want it in uh, want too much in your uh, in your beverage. Well, actually, it's illegal. This is this is another thing people don't understand. It's actually illegal to use the chemical um, in a different way than what the manufacturer writes on the label. Hmm. Um, and so, if you're in a professional brewing capacity and you're just kind of shooting from the hip and doing what you think is right. Um, you know, there's a legality to that. Unfortunately, a lot of breweries don't get inspected um, by um, 
who I see is can be your helpful friends is is your health department. Um, breweries that don't, you know, they're just kind of under the radar because they're making alcohol. But these little things are something that you know a health department is going to help you realize they're not going to necessarily dean you. You know, their health department many times is there to help you keep the public health safe and help you understand the law and um, and I, I think they can be a real good resource for breweries um, to learn from. A lot of breweries just as afraid to bring them in because they think they're going to, you know, be um, punitive. But not every health department is. There's the old cliche: "We're we're from the government. We're here to help." Uh, <laughs> <laughs> you know, and, and in quality, you've got to kind of keep an open mind and assume that's true. <laughs> <laughs> Now, yep. for, for, for home brewers and small craft brewers, we can farm out some of this stuff as far as, the, you know, the testing and the, and, the, and the lab services and such, can't we? Yeah. Um, there are um, testing services out there now, and they're not that expensive. Like, I, I think the, that landscape's changing faster than I've been able to keep up. Um, I know certainly there's more smaller yeast producers out there that are that are really kind of stretching the bounds of, of yeast that they're that they're um, propping up they're getting um, kind of in, that's I think that's becoming a very interesting place to for home brewers but yeah certainly testing is um, something that's out there you just have to look online I know Siebel Institute does some testing there's um, Spe- um, Gary Spedding does testing for people and it's not that expensive um, Forgive me because I don't know if there's any smaller home brewer testers at, test kits out there, but I'm sure there are testing services for home beers now that is not expensive. It's good to do. It's good to do on occasion just to kind of check, for example, your BUs. Are you actually getting the bitterness units that you think you are uh, calculated value-wise out of a batch? You know, that's a good check to do. So I always recommend testing if you can afford it. And, and the landscape is changing a lot with people intentionally souring uh, beers and uh, introducing, you know, or other organisms on purpose other than yeast into the beer. And uh, our friend uh, Jack McAuliffe, you know, who started the New Albion Brewery, uh, lives here in northwest Arkansas. And, and he's not a fan of sour beers because he mm-hmm. used to pour those down the drain. So, <laughs> <laughs> Right. So, think, so think the uh, quality landscape is changing. It is, and that's actually, you know, something I mentioned in my book. It introduces a lot of risk. So, you know, he's right in a sense that those beers, if if not handled properly, that can be a, a problem um, because now you've introduced this, this this microflora into your brewery that um, you may not want in your pale ale. And, and I, I don't think you can always um, pull the wool over people's eyes anymore and say, oh, this is a brand new style of beer I made. <laughs> Sour pale ale or whatever. <laughs> um, I don't think that's something that um, you can do anymore. I think that used to be the case, but not the case anymore. Yeah, I was judging a, a homebrew competition. They put me in the Belgian category, and uh, that was an adventure. Because uh, uh-huh. <laughs> a lot of homebrewers, if something goes sour un- unintentionally, they, they submit it as a Belgian. Uh, you know, And I use this, the descriptors... Um, uh, uh, animal shelter uh, <laughs> <laughs> on one of my score sheets. <laughs> That's not good. <laughs> <laughs> because there, there's the fecal stuff and then there's the uh, the solventy uh, stuff. <laughs> it's just brought me back to the animal shelter when I was a kid. Yeah. Um, so how do we how do we wrap this up? How do we put all the uh, all these elements together uh, into a a cohesive effective uh, quality management program? Um, I always say don't eat the elephant. Just take it slowly. Um, Add what tests you can, what inputs you can, measure what you can, when you can, and keep records of it. Um, And as you become more astute in your record keeping, you can start actually using those records to improve, um, tweak, you know, modify, change something up in which you're now um, improving a beer and trying to find that, that golden batch, you know. And then once you find that golden batch, um, you keep records of it so you know you're consistently making it. Um, I think that's really the essence of quality is, is start slow and start small and just keep adding to your body of knowledge as you go. There you go. Well, this has been fun. Mary, I yeah. appreciate your time. 
Thank you. Thanks for um, thanks for mentioning the book, and I, um, I hope I encourage folks not to not to shy away from quality. It's something everyone can do. There you go. Thanks, Mary. Thank you. Take care. Well, thanks again to Mary. Quality management is essential if you want to brew good beer, and uh, if you're a good, consistent brewer, you may already have a quality management program in place without even knowing it. For those looking to go pro, uh, Mary's Quality Management Essential Planning for Breweries is probably a good place to start uh, to get ideas on how to institute your own formal program. Don't forget to send me your favorite moments from Basic Brewing Radio over the uh, years. I'm, I'm, I'm putting together a compilation show for like next month for when we are uh, going to New Zealand, which is less than a month away now. Boy, that's... Exciting and scary at the same time. Until then, if you have brewing questions, show suggestions, or just want to say howdy, write to james at basicbrewing.com or just fill out the contact form on basicbrewing.com. And please don't forget to tell us where you're from. Check out our support link where you can throw a couple of bucks into the tip jar by subscribing financially to our podcast. Be sure to check out our DVDs, Extract Brewing and Partial Mashing, Stepping into All Grain, Low Tech Lagering, and Decoction Mashing, and Introduction to Wine Kits. You can find them all on our site. Get a free Basic Brewing bottle opener with any DVD combo, and you can check out our Basic Brewing shirts in the store as well. You can check out our logbooks, too, where you can track and log up to 50 batches of beer. Get a handle on your own quality management strategy by using our logbook. It's a good starting place. Thanks to everybody who's continued to click on our Amazon.com link. We appreciate the support there. Featured products this week that are purchased through the link are Jerry Thomas's Bartender's Guide. How to Mix Drinks, 1862 Reprint, a Bon Vivant's Companion. I might have read that one before. Sounds familiar, but I think I still think it's cool. And Set of Four Metal Earth 3D Laser Cut Models. Hubble Telescope, Apollo Lunar Rover, Apollo Lunar Module, and Mars Rover. Those look really cool. Thanks again, everybody. And remember, I can't tell who bought what, so no worries there. Just click on our Amazon.com logo on our site the next time you feel like Amazon shopping. We greatly appreciate your support. Don't forget, you can also join the American Homebrewers Association and subscribe to Brew Your Own Magazine through the associate links on basicbrewing.com. That's all until next time. Until then, thanks for listening, everybody. I'm James Spencer, production help for Basic Brewing Radio, and our website is provided by Kelly Dots in Austin, Texas. Basic Brewing Radio is a production of Active Voicing. We'll talk to you next time, everybody. So long. Music